So folks, what I want to do tonight is have a conversation. So I want to know what is in your minds, what kinds of issues are you struggling with, and try to bring as much of that into the conversation of the evening as possible. I'll give you some, you know, starting talking points, but really it is with the intent of what, you know, making you think in certain directions in the context of women and entrepreneurship. I have not really spoken very much on the topic of women and entrepreneurship. Only in the last year, year and a half, have I started writing more seriously about this topic. For a long time, I was much more bothered about being a successful entrepreneur than writing about women and entrepreneurship. It's a topic that I kind of avoided writing about or speaking about. Um, but I think the climate in the valley has changed. And um, one thing that bothered me greatly was that um, the valley was sensationalizing the topic of women in entrepreneurship in ways that I don't particularly like. I don't believe in the victim-oriented feminism. And for those of you, maybe some of you actually have read some of my writings, I don't write about victim-oriented feminism. So, recently a friend of mine, um, he's a venture capitalist, and a very close friend of mine for almost 20 years, brought his daughter, who is a you know, high school student, very bright, very charismatic, very high potential high school student to see me, just to kind of, you know, talk about these issues. And a um, charming girl, I was completely, I fell in love with her. And, uh, and she asked me what my philosophy of feminism was. And um, the reason I'm, I'm starting here is because this is key in everything else we're going to discuss tonight. My answer to her was, my philosophy of feminism is individualism. So as far as I'm concerned, if you believe in an individualism-oriented feminism, then if somebody decides to not work, not code, not, you know, pursue a career and raise children, that's just perfectly fine. And I don't have a problem with that. As long as you can keep yourself together. And here I have to tell you a story, and maybe some of you have read, I wrote a piece a little while ago called Talented Women, Please Do Not Quit. Have any of you read it? Who has read it? So several people have read it. It was, it had like 350,000 views on LinkedIn. So it was very widely read and very widely criticized actually. And uh, this for the first time, I wrote something very personal in this piece, and I talked about a friend of mine who did not work, and in her, when I became friends with her, she was already in her 50s. And she was a very nice, very warm, quite a talented person, and she had lost all her sense of self. She was in the empty nest phase of life and um, she committed suicide. And I had coffee with her the day before. And it really tore me to pieces. And it made me think about all these issues. This happened in 2008, so it's been a while now. Many years have passed and I've thought about life from many different angles and observed society, observed women, observed friends, observed family around us. And um, the reason I chose to write the Talented Women, Please Do Not Quit piece uh, about a year ago or a year and a half ago, something like that, was because I, I think this is a real issue. And this brings us back to the point I made, is I have no problems <coughs> If you choose not to work and be a full-time homemaker, you want to raise your child full-time, all that is perfectly fine, as long as you can keep it together. 
If you're going to arrive at midlife and implode, if you lose your self-confidence, sense of self, your identity and everything, then this is not a great option. And what, what I'm worried about is that this, is, this seems to be a phenomenon. It is not a one-off incident. It's a phenomenon. A lot of people who have um, not really act actualized themselves, not really had an identity outside of their um, family identity, their, their spouse and their children, are going through this phenomenon, and this is what bothers me. So, you are all professional women, and you're all dealing with, you know, some sort of choice issues, some sort of um, navigation issues, and I'll try to cover some of the things that I have learned and observed in the process that I think will, you know, are pragmatic things that you will be able to take away and practice in your life. And then you can ask me whatever, whatever you want to double click down upon, I'll be happy to double click with you. Um, my read about the world is that if you're trying to juggle a whole bunch of things, which most of us are, um, sometimes corporate careers become challenging. And entrepreneurship, although entrepreneurship is incredibly difficult, and it's not for everybody, I assume just by choosing to spend your evening with me here today, you have self-selected yourselves, that you, you are drawn to entrepreneurship. So you are looking at entrepreneurship as an option, and entrepreneurship, I think, is actually a part that can help you navigate this kind of balance, this kind of complicated equation. So, now in doing that, however, there are a bunch of myths, a bunch of, you know, conventional wisdom that you're going to need to get past. I'll focus most of the conversation, most of the early part of the talk there, and just stop me wherever you want to. The first thing I would like you to do is define success. We live in Silicon Valley which is a bit of a crazy place with a very absurd sense of reality. And this sense of reality has bred a myth that entrepreneurship equals financing. Everybody is running after financing. Entrepreneurship does not equal financing, I'm sorry. Entrepreneurship is customers, revenues and profits. Financing is optional. Exit is optional. Exit is not optional if you raise financing. If you raise financing, you're going to have to give your investors return on investment, in which case exit is a must. But if you don't have external financing, then exit is not necessary. You can continue to run. You can build a business to be $10 million a year without outside financing and never exit that business. That's just perfectly fine. And to me, that is a successful business. However, the entrepreneurship media, Silicon Valley, and now the entire world's entrepreneurship media has created this, perpetuated or propagated this myth that entrepreneurship equals financing. So everybody is running out of venture capital. First, one fine day you wake up and decide that you're going to be an entrepreneur and your first thing you do is run after VCs. This is really not very smart. And let's actually talk through why it's not smart. First and foremost, there are two, there are many criterias that have, and then many stars that have to align for you to qualify for venture capital financing, but there are two that are absolutely paramount. Number one is you need a company or a business that is going to grow at a hyper fast scale. Exponential growth. And two, you have to be working on a hyper large business opportunity. We're talking billion, multi-billion dollar business opportunity. And that is, these two factors have to be true for any venture to qualify for venture capital financing. And this is extremely rare. Billion dollar TAM, 
businesses are incredibly rare. There's a lot of arm waving that goes on at uh, investor presentations where people say, oh, this is a billion dollar opportunity, a $30 billion opportunity. Actually, if you really get to the bottom of it, there's a particular analysis that you have to present in any investor pitch, and it's called bottom-up TAM analysis. A bottom-up TAM analysis is not arm waving in the air. A bottom-up TAM analysis is a very precise mathematical model through which you explain how your total available market touches a billion dollars. And that is not an easy thing to do. However, there are numerous niche business opportunities, 5 million, 10 million, 15 million, 20 million dollar business opportunities that may not fit the venture capital model because they're smaller niche opportunities but you can build a business, you can have a wonderful life, you can be successful and have your own business, have lots of flexibility, lots of time and do lots of things with it and feel your sense of accomplishment and everything. Why do you have to be focused on your definition of success being venture capital financing? So this is something that I would like you to, as you're making your decisions along the way in your journey, I would like you to keep this as a point that is going to come up over and over again. As you make your decisions, this point is going to come up over and over again. Now, the other thing that I'm going to share with you is in 1 million by 1 million, which is my accelerator. We have a philosophy that we are using very successfully. I've been running 1 million by 1 million for more than five years now. And, you know, we've successfully incubated and accelerated many entrepreneurs. And I can say with a reasonable degree of confidence today, both based on that as well as we run a case study based program. So we have had over 700 successful entrepreneurs, including over 50, 50 entrepreneurs who've built billion dollar market cap companies, over 350 heavily financed, venture financed entrepreneurs, and we've also covered extensively the bootstrapped entrepreneurs. I can tell you for sure, bootstrap first, raise money later, is one of the more tried and true ways to build a successful business. And why is that? Primarily because you cannot really get financing on a concept anymore. When I first came to Silicon Valley, I moved to Silicon Valley at the end of 1996. So the internet was very new at the time, and we were building up to the dot-com bubble. The dot-com bubble was at its height in 1999. All through those years, I was a startup CEO. I did three startups between 1994 and 2000. I, was, I founded three startups, I was on the road and raising money continuously. And at that time, actually, you could get a concept financed. Today, that is no longer true. You cannot get a concept financed. Investors only fund businesses that are up and running and that already show traction. So how do you get there? Getting to a business that, is, that has product market fit and that has traction and, and is starting to show that, yes, this can grow at venture scale and can be a venture scale business. This is a lengthy period of time. It takes years. It takes surely many, many months, but it also sometimes takes many years to get to that. How do you get there? There's only one way to do that, and that's by bootstrapping and maybe with some friends and family capital, but that's it. No one's going to fund that phase of your business. And the other point is there are certain kinds of businesses that will never be financeable by venture capital. These are the smaller TAM niche businesses, and those you will have to bootstrap, you have no choice. And, and as I said, those businesses are perfectly worth building. One of my heroes from recent you know, stories is Linda Weinman. Linda founded lynda.com, you know, and she bootstrapped for many years, I think it was over 10 years, she, she only raised private equity funding, which was, she had you know, many tens of millions of dollars of revenue before she raised any money at all. And then eventually LinkedIn bought her company for $1.5 billion. Most of it went to Linda's pocket, Linda and her husband, I think. 
pocketed most of that money. Um, and what I like about that story is, first and foremost, not a Silicon Valley story. They were not here. So maybe that was good because they were not corrupted by this obsession with venture capital. They were in Ojai, California, near uh, Santa Barbara. And, um, and, and you know, the other phenomenon that happens when you get to that stage of validation, when you have a validated business that's generating quite a lot of rent revenue and so forth, investors start chasing you. You've turned the table. I keep saying in, you know, to the one and one of entrepreneurs that do not go to, go to VCs as beggars, go as kings. You can go as kings when you have revenue, when you have validated business model, when you have validated pricing model, and you're, you know, your numbers are churning, you have real metrics, you can go to VCs as kings. And to Linda, you can safely say that investors were calling her, investors wanted to invest in her, so she had nerve, she had a lot of you know, internal resolve to not get carried away by that and, and, and not take huge amounts of financing. She took financing at the very end. So this is why I really like her story is that, you know, it's a great, um, great example, a great case study for many of us to learn from, all of us to learn from. Okay. Um, the other myth that is running around, and this is what I told you I don't like, this victim-oriented feminism. The myth is that VCs are biased against women entrepreneurs. I don't buy this. VCs like to make money. And whatever they are, they're usually not stupid. So if you can actually show them that you are going to make them money, and this is how, that you have a traction business that is getting traction for blah, blah, blah reason. You understand your business. These are the unit economics of your business. These are the metrics of your business. This is how you're going to scale. And, you know, it's basically, you know, precise fundamentals driven discussions and, and real metrics. They will focus on making money. Now, if you go early, let's say you go with a concept, you go with a, some you know, not very convincing, let's say, wishy-washy presentation, wishy-washy storyline, then they get mischievous. So they've kind of very early, just by talking to you a little bit, they've figured out, I'm not going to invest in this company. But the entrepreneur is cute. Let's just flirt. That's when the trouble begins. If they think that they want to invest in your company, and you have the goods, they're not going to mess with you. Are you with me? Do you agree with me? Anybody disagrees? Am I saying anything that doesn't make sense? So, <laughs> um, now, there are actually very successful women entrepreneurs out there who are doing really well, and I know several of them personally. Um, Two people here, right here in Silicon Valley. One is Julia Hartz. She's a co-founder of Eventbrite. Um, and Emmy Pressman, co-founder of Medallia. They're both Silicon Valley-based women. And both of these companies, by the way, are case study, textbook case studies of bootstrap first, raise money, later stories. Both of them, both these companies validated early. Um, Eventbrite had revenues, had their revenue model validated and everything. Medallia had $30 million worth of revenue before they raised any financing. Both of these are unicorn companies, million dollar plus valuation, and they're heavily venture funded companies. So VCs have no problem with funding women entrepreneurs if you have the goods. Um, there's another entrepreneur who's not on this slide that I was thinking when I was driving here, I thought of her and I, she's one of my favorite entrepreneurs, Sirius Tucker. She has pink hair. She's probably about 60-something. She has pink hair. And uh, she has an enterprise software company selling financial reconciliation software to, to large enterprises. Um, she's doing it out of Southern California. Uh, the company was $20 million before she raised any financing. So it was bootstrapped up to that point. Then she sold a portion of it to private equity. So the Lake, I think, or Francisco Partners, I can't remember which one. Francisco Partners, good, thank you. Um, 
So Black Lion got a large chunk of venture capital. I think next year they're probably hit, they're going to hit $100 million in revenue. And they are, you know, close to unicorn level validation. Terrace wants to take the company public, etc. So, you know, I just don't see the, this bias that we are talking about in the media a lot. And, and there is a rejection bias that I'm noticing. The people who are opening their mouth too loudly, in my opinion, are the people who are not succeeding, who are getting rejected. And they're using sexism as an excuse, and they're not looking at their business metrics and business fundamentals as honestly, as intellectually honestly, as they should be looking at. And I've looked at some of I don't want, this is where I'm going to not name names, but I've read some of this commentary, and I've looked at their companies. I wouldn't invest in them. So, just because a male VC declines to invest, doesn't make them a fundable company. So, what I would like you to do is to remain till the very end, at whatever cost, intellectually honest. You'll have a much better relationship with yourself if you can do that. Because at the end of the day, if you do want to be a successful entrepreneur, hiding behind excuses is not going to get you there. You have to take a very honest, clear look at what your metrics are, where you're going wrong, where, what strategy you need to change, instead of hiding behind, behind these sensationalized excuses. So, and that, that's essentially this myth is the point. We see that rejection does not equal sexism. That is false. That is completely false. Over 99% of entrepreneurs who go out to raise financing actually get rejected. And this is true, you know, across genders. There's no gender bias in this. Uh, Mark Andreessen recently said in, an, in some interview that it is our job to reject entrepreneurs. It, a, a VC at any fund does maybe four to six investments a year. And they look at probably a couple of thousand investments each, investment opportunities each. So you guys are geeks, do the math. What does that tell you? It is their job to reject. And part of the reason is that this ultra high growth, they want to go from, you know, let's say zero to hundred million dollars in five years. This is very few businesses have the characteristics of fulfilling that agenda. And frankly, they are managing a portfolio. I, I, I think as an entrepreneur, actually, you, you need to keep this in mind that you are not managing a portfolio, you're managing your life. Every, every entrepreneurial venture you're going to do is going to take up five, seven, ten years of your life, sometimes more. And you need to, you need to be, you need to mitigate risks. You don't want to play a low probability game there. You want to, as much as possible, bend the probability curve in your direction, in your favor. So, if you have hit this kind of rate, if you're, if you're showing growth of a level where it warrants venture funding, then go for venture funding. If not, just chill out, you know? Just execute, get customers, get revenues, get, you know, become sustainable and build a business. And that's success. Okay, this one is very, yeah? I want to say that every VC who actually funds, if they fund, they expect a 10x to a 20x return back within a certain period of time. Right. They are, they are financial investors. They have, they have an agenda. Because Absolutely. They have to return the funds. They have to return the funds. Yes. Okay. Um, slightly different topic. VCs hit on women entrepreneurs. Well, going back to what I said earlier, they will only go in that direction. Men hit on women. So, sure, it's fair game. Have people hit on me? Yes, of course they have. But 
<laughs> that doesn't mean anything. If you want to live in society, the way nature has designed society, nature has designed society with men and women, and there is this thing called biology going on, you know? So yes, men hit on women, so what? But if you are an entrepreneur going to pitch to a VC, and the VC, the first thing the VC will do is not hit on you. The first thing they'll do is assess whether they want to invest in your company or not. If they don't want to invest in your company, then they will think about hitting on you. So, so I think, you know, if you, if you have the goods and if you really are presenting something compelling and, and worth considering in its business merit, I don't think they're going to pass on the opportunity of making money off you. They like money much more than hitting on you. So, going back to the intellectual honesty question, um, the question that you should ask yourselves, you need to learn to self-assess, basically. Is your business fundable? Or do you need to bootstrap? How long do you need to bootstrap? When is the right time for financing? There's a whole lot of other questions. So, I'll point you to a tool. This is a free self-assessment on the 1M1M site. It's, you, it's accessible from the homepage. And it has a set of questions. These are questions, if you go out to raise money, investors will ask you these questions. And I think all of us are investors in our own ventures, right? We are signing off huge chunks of our lives trying to build these businesses. So we are investing with our lives in these businesses. So these are questions we should be asking ourselves. And wherever you're getting stuck, where you don't have a good answer, you need to double click down and really figure out how you're going to answer that question, how you're going to tackle that bottleneck. And that is part of the rigor that we follow every day in the One Million by One Million program. One Million by One Million is very rigorous. It's none of these hiding behind excuses. I don't tolerate any of that, basically. From a philosophy point of view, this is outside of our program. Okay. One more, let me take a sip of water. <laughs> so, you know, somewhere along the way, feminism started portraying that being a successful woman and being a feminist is about having it all. And by having it all, it's having a career, uh, you know, really high-powered career, having, a, having children, having a family, etc. All of those were part of that checklist of items that need to be met. And uh, this is kind of where I, I disagree a bit with uh, Sheryl Sandberg's lean-in stuff. Um, I, I, I supported Sheryl's lean-in work in the beginning because it opened the, reopened the feminism debate after a long time and it was necessary to reopen that de debate. So on that score, I think it's been phenomenally successful. But I think she is also pushing this, you have to have it all business. And I think the, my, you know, I'm 45. My conclusion at this point, having lived through some amount of life and having some life experience is that it's not really smart to expect that you can have everything at once. You're going to have to prioritize, you're going to have to trade off, and um, you're going to have to define what is important for you, and you have to go back to that philosophy of individualism and authenticity. Who are you? Who am I? What is important to me? What is my priority? That should drive what having it all means for you. So what I want to do is look at a few options. So if you decide that entrepreneurship is what is important to you and you want to be an entrepreneur, you could 
do a bootstrap company while you're raising children, especially when your children are small. Because that frees you from the pressure of this hyper fast growth, you know, delivering to investor expectations of hyper fast growth. And, you know, I've run both kinds of companies. I've run venture funded companies as well as bootstrap companies. This is my fourth company. One million by one million, by the way, is not a non-profit. It's a, it's a, you know, full business. It's a startup in any sense of the word. However, and when I started, actually, when I started one million by one million, in the summer of 2010, I have a lot of friends in the VC business, and several of them offered to fund me. And I didn't take that funding. And I, I, every day I kind of thank myself for not having done that. And, and there is a certain pressure that comes with venture capital. There are investor expectations you have to meet. And if you have on top of that small children that you're raising, it is not an easy equation to balance. So you're going to have to do, make some trade-offs, and one of those trade-offs could be to not raise venture capital while you're also raising small children. The other option is don't, don't have children while doing a VC-funded company. Okay, let's say you choose the other route. You are doing a VC-funded company, that's important to you, and you've decided somehow that, yeah, I have to show the world that I can raise venture capital, and that's my definition of success. Fine. I'm not arguing with it, no problem. Do it, but maybe this is not a great scenario under which you should also elect to have small children. Um, outsource. So um, I've had this conversation with many of the people who are doing successful entrepreneurial ventures with children. Julia Hartz, for instance, has a, an army of staff, basically, and she has family. Her family and her um, in-laws are all in the area. So that creates a very interesting situation. If you have, you know, if both sets of parents are in the area and are willing to support you, that actually gives you a certain sets of options. And in my case, my parents live in India. My husband's parents are not well, they used to live in Belgium, and, and now they've passed. Um, so for immigrant families, especially if you're, you know, 100% immigrant family, with the entire couple is, is immigrants, um, this is not usually an option. You can still hire help, of course. Nannies, your battery of nannies will do it. Cost money. It's very expensive. Yes. I was just going to say, in terms of outsourcing, you also might have a spouse who might be able to take extra duties. Yes, and, and this is an option, a stay-at-home spouse or a spouse who works part-time or a, you know, so there is, you know, for generations and generations, men have pursued high-powered careers with a stay-at-home spouse, right? That formula works. So it is an option if that's okay with you, if that's what you want to do, that's an option. Uh, I already talked about this. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Delay is a great option, actually. So Therese Tucker, whom I was talking about earlier, I had a lengthy conversation about this topic with her as well, and, and Therese actually had a large company career first. So she didn't start her entrepreneurial venture until much later in her life when her children were already you know, much older. So that also is a strategy that I know a lot of women are using, is to do the child rearing years in a large company in a less stressful job. And, and a lot of large companies actually have great maternity programs and great kind of childcare programs, etc., etc., etc. So, you know, Facebook would be great, I think. To, uh, to go do that in, that's an option. And then you can also choose not to have children. And this is a perfectly fine option. This is the option I've chosen. I realize that I'm more an entrepreneur than anything else. And um, I just did, and my, you know, I don't have family here and I didn't want to outsource, I didn't want somebody else raising my children. 
So I decided that, okay, I, you know, this is an option that I'm going to trade off. And it works fine. There is, there, there's a, you know, kind of strange um, dynamic. There are a lot of women who feel that it's unwomanly to not have, to choose not to have, it's okay to not be able to have children, but it's unwomanly to choose not to have children. You know, I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> There's not very much that other people tell me how to do or what to do about. So going back to individualism, going back to authenticity, I would like all of you to have on many more instances and many more occasions be able to say, I don't give a shit. That's going to help you tremendously. If you care a lot about what other people think of your choices, you're going to get constrained and constrained and blocked all the way, all the time. But if you have internal conviction, if you have faith on yourself, if you have faith on your own conviction, you can do whatever you want. For me, you know, what I've chosen to do with One Million by One Million is tremendously meaningful. And I am optimizing on a bunch of different fronts on a bunch of different vectors. One of them is impact. One million by one million is one million entrepreneurs reaching a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue, building a trillion dollars of global GDP and 10 million jobs. It's a very audacious, very far-reaching global agenda. And it consumes me. I don't have emotional energy on top of this to raise children, frankly. I don't think I would do a very good job of this if I had to do it in parallel. On top of that, some of you know that I write like crazy. I'm like a prolific writer. And you know, none of this, none of this would have been physically possible if I weren't willing to trade a few things off. So, you know, these are choices and trade-offs that you make. And you just have to have faith in your own prioritizations, in your own trade-offs, and a full understanding of why you're making those trade-offs. Um, a couple of other very pragmatic myths. You have to quit a job, quit your job to start a company. This is false. In fact, the rate of failure of companies that get started in a bootstrapping using a paycheck mode is actually much higher because you don't run out of cash. You're using your paycheck to pay your bills. So it gives you actually the bootstrapping money with which you can validate your business on the side and, and once the business is hitting its stride, you can quit. And you're quitting into a situation that is much more secure than an unvalidated concept. We use this a lot in One Million by One Million. We have tons of entrepreneurs using this very successfully, and I have tons. I've written a book on this topic with, you know, all, all my Entrepreneur Journeys books, by the way, are case study based. So you can look it up and, and see how other people are doing what and how, what works. The other one is services companies are uninteresting. Services companies have a brilliant characteristic. They start generating cash right away. There's no 18, 24, 36 months of product development that you have to fund with red ink. Services companies generate cash. And if you're doing a services company in an area where you have, you're going to be building your product and you have customer relationships, the customers are telling you what they want, you have customer intimacy, you're getting specs, you're getting feedback, you're getting validation, there is nothing wrong with the services companies. Oracle, by the way, was starting and started in this mode of bootstrapping using services. So. Don't get carried away by this myth, yeah? So I'm, I'm actually curious about um, how many instances have you seen where a company gets started where they have, they're offering services, but at the same time developing a product. That's kind of how my company started, Numerous. started out. Numerous. And our problem was just the focus, right? The and trying to set, you know, the sales side and the marketing side of the services as opposed you to... You come work with me, I'll coach you through this. This is a tried and true process. We see this all the time. We use this methodology all the time. The bootstrapping using services. I've done a book in Entrepreneur Journeys on this as well, by the way, full of case studies. There are probably 12 to 16 case studies on just that topic. So. 
you know, if, you, if that's a topic you want to double click down on, we have plenty of expertise in this. <laughs> Lifestyle businesses aren't sexy. How many of you have fallen into the, this trap? No one's going to show their hands because they're embarrassed. I have a lifestyle business. <laughs> Good. See, the, the problem we have is this venture capital is a cottage industry. And we have this tail wagging the dog scenario. They're pronouncing that lifestyle, oh, it's just a lifestyle business. No, it's, you know, lifestyle businesses are great. So if you make five, ten million dollars a year running a lifestyle business, what is wrong with this picture? And I'll tell you, my, I've optimized my business life today, as I said, for impact, but also for lifestyle. So in November, I went off with my husband to Europe for three weeks. We went to London, Vienna, Prague and Budapest, listening to classical music, watching plays, looking at art, architecture, this is what we like to do. I don't have to answer to anybody. I'm my boss. I don't answer to investors why I'm going off for three weeks. I don't have to do anything. I'm, I do exactly what I please. And that is wonderful. So that is part of my definition of success, is control over your life and something that gets missed very often, control over your time. Can you imagine? I run a startup company, a startup company, it's six years old, but it's, it's a small business, you know, it's, it's a very high impact small business, it's a pretty, it has a large footprint small business, but I'm, I'm a startup CEO. But I can, twice a year, take off for three weeks in Europe and just do whatever I want to. I have control over my time. To me, that is success. And I don't care what VC tells me that, oh, you're just lying, running a lifestyle business. Yes, by choice. I am running a lifestyle business. Um, <laughs> the other myth is that VC funded entrepreneurs make a lot more money. This is not true because people who have more equity usually make more money. So let's look at a cartoon here. It's a cafe scene where Sarah and Jim are standing in the coffee line. And um, Sarah says, hey, Jim, what have you been up to? It's a little sh small, the lettering, so I'll read it out. Jim says, hi, Sarah, I just sold my business. It took me five years to build it. And Sarah says, what a coincidence. I, too, just sold my business. Since lots of great investors funded me, I ended up owning 5% in the end. 5% for a founder after multiple rounds of financing is not a bad ownership ratio. So he, for what he was doing, he did just fine. And we sold it for a whopping $100 million, so I now have $5 million in the bank. Sarah says, hmm, I sold mine for just $25 million, but I didn't have any investment. But come to think of it, I'm glad I didn't. I have $25 million in the bank right now. And now Jim wakes up and realizes that, oh shit, he's learning to do math. You are all geeks. You can do the math. Anytime you're in a situation where you're diluting yourselves heavily, pause and reconsider. Actually, uh, very often, and I started off by giving you the story of Linda, yeah. you make a lot more money bootstrapping your company than you do raising venture capital, unless you're doing Facebook, in which case it doesn't matter. Okay, so summary. Somehow something is cutting off here. Anyway, so I guess there's just three points that I want to make. Bootstrap first, raise money later, if at all. That's one mantra I want you to take away. Make smart choices, smart trade-offs. Don't try to have it all, especially not all at once. And then the third point is focus on business fundamentals. Don't hide behind sexism as an excuse. That's pretty much all I want to 
start off with. But I, as I said, what I really want to have is a conversation. So tell me what's in your head. What are you thinking? 